Sankofa Back to the source Sankofa Back where our ancestors came Back to the source Sankofa Hotel Peace Welcome to another edition of Sankofa Lessons from Black History. My name is Baba Andar Ma'at, and I'm honored to have this opportunity to share with you lessons from black history. First, Sankofa. Sankofa is an African word that means go back and fetch it. Return to the source. If you ever see the symbol, the Sankofa bird, it's an Adinkra symbol, and it's very important to understand the meaning of this powerful symbol. It's the symbol of a mythic bird. The bird has its head turned backwards as to suggest that we must always go back and learn from the past. The feet of the bird are facing forward, meaning that we must move from today into tomorrow into the future based upon the lessons that we learned from the past. And in the mouth of the bird is an egg reflecting and re recognizing that we have a prosperous and a very powerful future if we learn the lessons from the past as we move into the future. Sankofa, lessons from black history. The purpose of our program is to go back and look back at our history, look at black history, and from that extract the valuable lessons that we can learn from the past, bring them forward to today, learn from them and apply them as we move into the future. Sankofa, lessons from black history. Today, we are honored to have this opportunity to share with you a clip from a film, Walk on the River, a black history of the Alamo City. This film is documenting the black history of San Antonio from 1865 to 1965. Today, we want to share with you a section of that film titled Service and Community. And then we want to come back and just speak with you very briefly about lessons that we can learn from our history. Dear Langston, the Negro now speaks of a new river, fed from the mouth of patroness Guadalupe, heavenly in all of her ways. This river is flowing rich and sacredly throughout San Antonio. Patron of lost things, may we be found flourishing beneath its wet ivory and indigo wings, washed in its waters. This river will rinse us a southern baptismal clean. It branches out, winding and rushing, bubbling from Blue Hole and San Pedro Springs. Here, the black man and black woman sing its praises. You found us growing, cultivating commerce on Commerce Street, baking in the heat off W.W. W. White right on up to Martin Luther King. We cross that freedom bridge and live out our lives, thriving to the pulse of this river. This river is a super soulful shakedown, as spiritually stirring as a hymnal saying it's St. James AME on Richter Street. It's as sweet as pecan pies made with maple brown hands. The African American utters of rivers, and it echoes throughout from the ranch land to the missions, all the way into the urban areas elevated to the Tower of Americas. We are submerged in this drawl and twang, every word we speak, and all the hope that we drink like communion wine. We found our divine purpose deep in the heart of the Lone Star State. We know our blood, sweat, and tears are what make this city great. Every child, woman, and man that reside here in San Antonio are sun-stricken and baked to perfection. 
Our skin is ridden with powerful rays as we hear the mighty rushing ripples and waves of this water. It will be our refreshment, the bounty that waters our seed. Yes, we will continue speaking of this river and may its waters never recede. In the late 1800s, the state of Texas had no orphanage for black children. In 1897, Mrs. Ella Austin founded the Ella Austin Orphanage for Black Children in San Antonio. With the help of the Progressive Women's Club, in 1968, the Ella Austin Orphanage became a multi-purpose center providing community services to East Side residents. Because there were black kids that lost their parents or became separated for whatever reason or another and they lived in the orphanage and it was called Ella Austin Orphanage for Destitute Colored Children. There was a club here in the city called the Progressive Women's Club. They provided what she needed for the school. In 1891, James Todd Walton, J.T. Walton, a black physician and philanthropist, established his practice in San Antonio. Throughout his life, he provided free medical care for the Ella Austin Orphanage and was a chief financial backer for the Camp Founders Girls Organization. In addition, Dr. Walton purchased property and built the only public playground for black children at the time. The park was known as the Walton Park, then the Colored Park, and finally the Fairchild Park the camp founder girls. It was a camp for, for young girls. A lot of people may not have heard about that, but uh, back during those days of uh, segregation, young black girls couldn't join camp fire girls. Due to discriminatory practices in the 20s, young black girls were unable to join camp fire girls, nor were charters being granted. Therefore, in 1924, Mrs. Maddie Landry founded and organized Camp Founder Girls in San Antonio at St. Paul Methodist Church. I remember the many days that we had fundraisers with Maddie Landry, who always worked hard. Uh, the Camp Founders Girls for providing a place for young girls and women to, to learn the kinds of life skills and teamwork skills. We were able to um, stay in cabin type um, dwellings, but they did have campfire um, experiences. But she had land in Bernie, and every summer you could go to camp in Bernie. Uh, we would elect a Queen of Soul every year. We were very proud to see our Queen riding down Broadway on a float, waving to, you know, just like the other Queens. Um, Miss Dignity was another way, uh, a junior beauty Queen, you might say, and she would ride down the float. So we were very proud. Due to medical exclusion or being underserved, blacks created and operated a number of medical centers on the east side in San Antonio, such as the Whittier Clinic, the Good Samaritan Hospital, the Ruth Bellinger Medical Clinic, Hicks Maternity Hospital, and the Ella Austin Health Center. In the 1920s, Dr. Charles Austin Whittier established the Whittier Clinic. He had two overnight rooms where he performed minor surgery and kept patients overnight. In addition, Dr. Whittier offered a training facility for black interns in his clinic. Dr. C.A. Whittier and Dr. Onsi Whittier, they were brothers and they were both doctors. Dr. Eugene Fuller, who was down on Cherry Street. We had um, um, the Good Samaritan Hospital on Connolly Street. Now, that was a black hospital. Now, as a matter of fact, it's the only black hospital I can remember coming up was the Good Samaritan Hospital. When hospitals were racially segregated, the Good Samaritan Hospital served as the hospital for blacks in San Antonio. The structure was built around 1915 and converted into a hospital for black patients in the 1940s. 
It opened as a 70-bed facility with laboratories, x-ray, fluoroscopy, and two operating rooms. Dr. Frank Bryant was the co-founder and first medical director of Ella Austin Health Center in 1978. He recognized that East San Antonio was medically underserved, so he used his talent to correct this deficiency. Dr. Robert Lee Moore Hilliard was born and raised in San Antonio and graduated as salutatorian of Phyllis Wheatley High School class of 1947. From the beginning to the end of his medical practice, he delivered over 14,000 babies in San Antonio. Uh, he started practice here and he, um, he integrated many hospitals. He was the first um, black resident in OBGYN in the South. He was the first chief resident in the South, uh, not just Texas, but throughout the South. Um, he was the first um, surgeon uh, to do uh, surgery on a Caucasian uh, in, the, in, the, in the city. Uh, and he was uh, the first surgeon to do surgery in the hospital here in town. Uh, he came after other doctors like C.A. Whittier, um, uh, who opened the doors also, but he was one who just fought tirelessly for, for us. Mrs. Hattie Ellum Briscoe. With pride and determination, she made history in the legal profession. In 1956, she graduated first in her class at St. Mary's School of Law. After no law firms in San Antonio would hire her, she established her own practice. She was the first black woman to practice law in Bear County, Texas, and was the only one for 27 years, from 1956 to 1983. Mrs. Myra Davis Hemmings. Myra Hemmings uh, taught English at Phyllis Wheatley High School here in San Antonio, but what she did went on to change the world. Uh, I'm a Delta. So Delta Sigma Theta was really significant here in San Antonio because of Mrs. Hemmings uh, in San Antonio went to Howard University in Washington, D.C. And she joined AKA Alpha Kappa Alpha and had been at one time president of that sorority. So she broke from AKAs and joined that feminist movement and was one of the founders of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority at Howard University in Washington, D.C. In 1944, Mrs. Hemmings co-produced, co-directed, and starred in Go Down Death, now a black film classic produced in San Antonio. You will take that picture out of that camera now and burn it up. Come on, man, let's get out of here. And so she contributed to uh, an African-American film presence that we had in the 1940s. For nearly a hundred years, the Carver Community Cultural Center, the Carver, has served as the East Side's foremost gathering place of cultural exchange and performance arts. It was originally erected in 1918 as a community center for African-Americans. By the 1930s, the building was repurposed as the Colored Library and renamed the Carver Library and Auditorium in honor of Dr. George Washington Carver. The ground was broken for the Colored Branch of San Antonio Public Library, and that's that uh, Carver Community Cultural Center that you see on Hackberry Street. And we had other dancers, like Cab Calloway come in, Tom Basin, Jimmy Lumpen. They had, you had to have new dancers there. They there was Prudence Curry, who was uh, a pastor's wife and a very accomplished woman in her own right. She was installed as the first manager of their branch and she served there until 1958. Another guy named Grumbles, he was the first president of the NAACP and a very wealthy African-American. He's the one who actually owned the land that the Carver Cultural Center is now on. Later on, when Bellinger becomes the black political boss, he gets the money from the city to establish the Carver Library. In San Antonio, blacks have made significant contributions to military history. The Buffalo Soldiers, a segregated army unit made up mostly of black soldiers from 1866 until the early 1890s. They were known as peacekeepers of the West and respected for their fighting ability. 
See, you read about the Buffalo Soldier, but in the history book, it'll say the ninth cavalry, the tenth cavalry. They just forget to tell you that all the soldiers in the ninth and tenth cavalry were black. And they, at first, they was called the Colored Army. 1866, they was organized as the Colored Army. But when they came west, the Indians had never seen nothing but white soldiers. And they saw how the, the Buffalo, how the, the Colored Soldier fought. They was dark like the buffalo, they had woolly hair like the buffalo, and, and the fierceness of the buffalo. And the buffalo, so the colored soldiers didn't like to be called colored no way, and they considered that an honor. So in 1872, early, I always say early 1870s because some people say 72, some say 73. So they was allowed to use the buffalo soldier patch and was given a name, the Buffalo Soldier. And they did whatever was required of them. They had the less desertion of any uh, unit in the military, less desertion. The Tuskegee Airmen became one of the most highly respected fighter groups of World War II. Today, there's a museum at Randolph Air Force Base that features the history of the Tuskegee Airmen and a San Antonio chapter in spite of the honorable service of blacks in the military during the Jim Crow segregation era, black soldiers were prosecuted in the largest military trial in U.S. history at Fort Sam Houston. Reverend Kelly was the pastor of uh, Second Baptist Church. He also read the, the last prayer of the soldiers that were executed at Fort Sam Houston. Uh, those uh, black GIs who had a, a mutiny there in Houston and was marched down here to Salado Creek here and, and hang on the Salado Creek here in San Antonio. A racial riot in Houston led to black soldiers from the 24th Infantry Regiment being sent to San Antonio. For their role in the riot, the men were tried, found guilty of mutiny, and sentenced to death. 13 black soldiers were hanged in San Antonio in 1917. Joe Williams played for the San Antonio Black Broncos, a Negro League baseball team based in San Antonio, Texas in 1908 and 1909. He was a right-handed pitcher and his nickname was Cyclone Joe or Smokey Joe. He is widely recognized as one of the game's greatest pitchers, even though he never played a game in the major leagues. He was elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame in 1999. John Miles was a Tuskegee Airman and a professional baseball player for the Chicago American Giants in the Negro Leagues from 1946 to 1948. He was known as John Mule Miles because it was said that he hit the baseball as hard as a mule kicks. As part of Negro League history, John Miles is famous for hitting 11 home runs in 11 straight games. Willie Mitchell was a professional football player and Super Bowl champion with the Kansas City Chiefs in 1969. He grew up in East San Antonio and was a 1959 graduate of Wheatley High School. Warren McVay was one of the greatest running backs in state history. As a junior at Brackenridge, he helped lead them to the state championship. He made history in 1965 when he became the first black to play for a major college football team in Texas, the University of Houston. Clyde Glosson was a 1965 graduate of Wheatley High School and a state champion and national record holder in the 100 meter dash. He went on to become a two-time NCAA track and field sprint champion at Trinity University and the University of Texas at El Paso. He was an alternate track member on the 1968 Olympic team. For San Antonio to, to recognize me as, as, as one of, the, uh, of their uh, outstanding athletes, I appreciate it. I really do. Keyhole Club was an entertainment venue that operated in the 1940s through the 1960s on both the east side and west side of San Antonio. Owned by Don Albert Dominique, the Keyhole Nightclub entertained blacks, whites, Hispanics, 
and anyone looking for a good time. As an integrated entertainment venue, the Keyhole was ahead of its time in breaking down racial segregation barriers due largely in part to Don Albert's inclusive attitude. The famed Eastwood Country Club owned by Johnny Phillips, provided a showcase for black entertainers. You, I think in 1954, uh, Johnny Phillips opened his Eastwood Country Club out uh, in East Bear County. And so if you were one of, one of those smaller groups on the Chitlin circuit, and you were coming to this neck of the woods, you played Eastwood Country Club. Red Fox, the comedian, this was a regular stop uh, for him. And when he, he wasn't on stage, he tended bar. The most famous of the entertainers at Eastwood Country Club and was a fixture there was a lady dancer, and she was a lady, named Miss Wiggles. Back in the day, it would be called shake dancing. And she would do a headstand on that chair. And she would do her shake dance while doing a headstand. And while she did it, she, she was so athletic that she could move that chair in a 360 degree circle while doing her shake dance while standing on her head on that chair. So Eastwood Country Club gave you the Chitlin Circuit, tri trios, quartets, singers, instrumentalists, and Miss Wiggles. That was Walk on the River, a black history of the Alamo City. First, let me share with you the title, Walk on the River. You may realize or may I know about the great poet Langston Hughes. He wrote a very famous poem titled, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. In this poem, Langston Hughes says, I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers. He said, I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut near the Congo and it lulled me to sleep. I stood upon the Nile and raised pyramids above it. What Langston Hughes is saying in this great poem is that Africans have been here since the beginning of dawn and have built on great rivers of the world. So Walk on the River is a takeoff of that poem. The city of San Antonio is known as the River City. And here in San Antonio, African Americans have contributed to the great growth and development of this city since the dawn and the founding of this city. Now, in this particular clip you just watched, I just wanted to share with you something that really is very important about lessons from black history. See, when we study our history, we learn from the past, we bring those lessons forward and we apply them as we move into the future. One of the great lessons out of this story is that the story of Miss Maddie Landry. Miss Maddie Landry was the founder of the Camp Founders Girls. And let me just share with you the importance of this because we're talking about a period in time where we were segregated. America was segregated and African Americans were forced into a situation where they had to, we had to practice self-determination and creativity. In the 1920s, that was an organization with a program called the Camp Fire Girls. It was a white organization, and they would not permit black girls to be a part of that program. And they would not permit the black community to establish chapters of that program. Miss Maddie Landry, realizing the importance of grooming young ladies into becoming strong women of the community, wanted to establish a program to help the development of these young girls. So she established the Camp Founders Girls in 1924. 
in that program, they would travel up into Bernie where they had property and they would camp for two weeks as shared with us by Miss Nettie Hinton and Miss Gaynell Gaynor. These are two women at that time who were young women who went to the camp with Miss Maddie Landry. And they shared their experience. Well, today, these women are very active in the community, very powerful women doing great things. And a part of that development, a part of their development, was to count founders girls established by Miss Maddie Landry. Well, Miss Maddie Landry passed and the program went away. But due to the fact that we documented this information in the film, Walk on the River, A Black History of the Alamo City, there are those today who recognize the importance of this kind of program and how much this is needed for young girls today. So they have resurrected this program. And they suggest and they say that they wanted to build on the legacy of Miss Maddie Landry and the Count Founders Girls. It was a group of African-American teachers here in San Antonio that came together to establish this program. And it kicked off in 2019 where they established a camp. And in the camp, they wanted to encourage young women to have an outdoor experience. And their aim was to encourage them to be strong, brave, creative, and confident. And they wanted to have this experience because they recognized that history tells us that something that was very powerful in the past can be resurrected today and have a significant impact and make a significant contribution to society today. Lessons from black history tells us that we must look back into the past as we plan for a greater future. In this clip of the film, the example of Miss Maddie Landry is a great example of Sankofa, lessons from black history. Well, thank you again for joining us for this segment in this edition of Sankofa, lessons from black history. Once again, we say thank you because as we look back in the past, we all gain greater knowledge as we move into the future, building a greater city, a greater nation, and a greater world based on the lessons of yesterday. Sankofa, lessons from black history. Thank you. Sankofa.